Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having us today. Um, this is Samia and I'm Pierre. We are coming from a company called Tukantoko. Um, we are doing a, a software platform which does uh, reporting and data visualization. And we, it's a company which is based in Paris. It's three years old and it's uh, self-funded and profitable. We come today to um, contribute to the, one of the team of the conference, which was the future of data science. And uh, there's one saying which uh, you should uh, sometimes look back. <laughs> um, so, come, okay. we should, you should sometimes look uh, back into the past to, to anticipate uh, what's coming into the future. And as a data engin engineer, when I look uh, into the past, maybe 10 years ago, I feel very lucky to be working in 2018 with a set of quite m m mature technologies. In my world, it would be SciPy or Matplotlib, which are around since uh, 2000, and Pandas, which is 10 years old. <coughs> and for me, what those technologies uh, brought when you combine them with a uh, cheap uh, memory is that uh, you can do interactive computing. Uh, what, what interactive computing is, is a new paradigm for data exploration where I load my data set in memory, I apply some transformation, and I see the results uh, nearly immediately. <coughs> the, it works like a dialogue between uh, you and uh, your data set. This is undeniably um, a big change in the way we are working uh, with big data sets. Uh, namely, it's a big change from executing queries and uh, recording the results uh, on disk. And it's been very successful. Uh, last year, for example, Panda received the uh, ACM Software Systems Awards. And uh, during the uh, uh, ceremony, it was, uh, clearly it was clear that interactive computing was the main uh, uh, differentiating factor of, uh, of tools like Jupyter's and Air Studio. And there's no selling short this, uh, this type of computing. Um, it's, uh, it clearly has changed the way we work. But um, like every successful paradigm, it's been uh, expanding outside the uh, territory where it's very useful and sane. And as a data engineer, you may have been working with uh, many types of uh, notebooks, but uh, it's not uncommon to see notebooks degenerating into not so much a civilized conversation between you and your data, but more like a drunken late night talk between uh, airy data scientists and some fuzzy data sets. And this intuition or this experience has recently been uh, quantified by researchers from UC San Diego and uh, Université de Lyon in France in a paper which is called Exploration and Explanation in Computational Notebooks. The, they use a quantitative approach uh, on corpus of notebooks, uh, one million notebooks coming from GitHub and 200 coming from uh, pu publication, scientific publications. <coughs> and they um, try to measure inside those notebooks what was text, what was code, what was visualization, what was headings, and their results all that only a minority of the notebooks is discussing and reasoning on the data and the computation that is uh, presented in the no <coughs> notebook. And uh, this, for them, demonstrates the tension between exploration and explanation in data science. And this issue uh, resonates with the wider discussion in computer science of uh, refactoring and technical debt. So it could well be that with technologies such as Jupyter or, or Studio, we are producing a lot of code, which is actually uh, technical debt. And why is it technical debt? Mostly because it's a, it's a closed system between one guy programming the notebook and his data. It's not open to other an audience. It's not open to communicate something reasoning or result to a wider public. The way we address this problem is using a concept which comes mostly from uh, interaction design, which is data storytelling. Uh, it's uh, based on areas of uh, research, which are sometimes called uh, explorable explanation or computational narratives. But 
mainly it boils down to three things, which are, firstly, uh, we bring back the readership into uh, computer science, as in, we think that uh, computer science should be, I mean, interactive computing should be um, aimed at an audience. It should speak to at least somebody. And it should be a narrative uh, explaining the meaning of your data. This is done by uh, being fitting inside the frame, being bounded by uh, a story, and going into steps. So you're going to show in steps what what, the tr what transformation you're doing on a, on a data set and uh, what, it, what meaning it has. A very simple example of that is a, a, a chart, which I will show you in a, in a minute. It's very simple, and, but it's uh, one of the main selling points of our software, of our, of our solution, uh, because it's, it has all those three elements, being bounded in a frame, having steps, and, and explaining data. So it's a waterfall chart. It shows an evolution between a value here, a quantity here, and a quantity here. And in typical waterfall style, it shows uh, what are the quantities that contribute to this evolution. And when you click on one of the quantities, you can zoom in on the quantities that are making it inside. So it's very simple. It's just animation of squares in, inside the frame. But it fits in a, <coughs> in, a, in a market need, which is to explain quantities in a visual way and, and tell simply about um, a, a data set. So um, we would like to continue by showing you that to arrive to this kind of uh, presentations, we, we have developed a, a methodology, which is to um, analyze the different ways you can present data visually inside the story by steps. And one way to illustrate this is to use algorithms, because algorithms are very simple stories with a start and an end and steps in the middle. So Samia is going to show you how we've uh, come to analyze all the different ways to represent visually uh, the sorting algorithms. Thank you. Uh, so for, for this, uh, thinking about how we can visualize an algorithm uh, and as uh, data visualize uh, lovers, uh, what we've done is that we've chosen one algorithm. So we've chosen one really simple, uh, uh, basically the sorting algorithm. So what is it? It's so simply creating order from disorder. So we have cards that are disordered, and we want to make an order. There are many ways to, uh, to solve this problem. Some are really complex. Uh, others are really sim simple, but uh, less efficient. So we're going to see how people tried uh, till today to visualize this algorithm. So here's the first example. So it's not data visualization, but we have the code. And it's not that uh, uh, meaningful when we, we see it. The first way to, to see it is to see it uh, through a matrix. So it's a heat map in data visualization. You have all the algorithms, for example. You can compare them by many criteria. For example, uh, the uh, time complexity with the best average and worst scenario. You can see also the space uh, complexity with the memory and the stability. Here's a way to compare them. But the problem with that visualization is that we don't see how they behave. We, don't co we cannot compare them. So let's see how we can see the behavior. Here is one way to visualize them that we can see on, on the internet uh, easily. It's really like simple uh, ways to describe them. We have two sorting, so the insertion and the bubble. Uh, insertion, one of the simplest one. Um, so we can see here the first state. Uh, the initial state, and then the solving till the sorting, uh, the sorting uh, disk. Um, we can see step by step. The red ones, the, the red uh, uh, squares are the ones that are swapped, and the green, the elements that are already sorted. Um, so here we can also see another information, which is the blocks that we can distinguish, which are the loops during the instruction. So we have uh, those information that we can see. Uh, the good thing with that visualization is that we have a good explicability, expli explainability. And uh, the bad thing with this visualization is that we cannot uh, consider that it's a complex algorithm, as we have few figures. Uh, so it's not useful for biggest algorithms. So let's see how we can improve this uh, visualization, as we can say that it's a, a sparse static display because it's not moving. So what we can add to this uh, visualization is animation, 
with what we uh, what we can see on internet also. So here's an example of a website, uh, Visual Go. Uh, so we can choose in the header one of the algorithm. So here it's a selection sort, and you can see uh, the animation. Uh, so it's nice to watch because you see uh, all the, the cards move in. You have the code also, but it, it doesn't give any more information. However, we can, um, in an intuitive way, in a nice way, understand how all the algorithms behave. Um, the also, the, the good thing that we have with this uh, animation is that time, the process of time, is mapped to time. So we just have to wait and see how the, 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 the algorithm proceeds. Um, the only bad thing that we can uh, give to this way of visualization is that it relies on our memory. So when you see it, you say, OK, here, uh, something happened. I didn't understand what's happening. We cannot focus and go back uh, during the animation. That's the main, uh, the, the, the principal drawback of this visualization. So for, um, for having more information, people add this, uh, this bar to control time and go back during uh, the, the process. Mike Bostock, which is a, a, a great visualizer with the uh, D3GS, for example, um, tried to say that animations were less useful than really dense and static display. So his, uh, his, uh, um, his point of view is that this animation uh, this static view is clearer than an animation. Here we have the quick sort, quick sort algorithm. Um, how, how do it behave? We have at each line a uh, pivot, which is in red, uh, which uh, we sort all the elements that are in the left side are lower and the right side are uh, larger. And then we repeat this each time by taking a pivot in the middle. Uh, when the, the, the pivot is sorted, we put it in a gray uh, color. So here, his uh, objective is not to put all the steps, but only taking the key, the key frames uh, that explain the algorithm. So for him, it's better to use a static and dense way, uh, because I can scan faster than the hand, for example, in an animation. So you can focus on a, a, a specific step and say, OK, what happened here from this step to this step, and focus on that step. Uh, without uh, 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 losing all the information. So for him, it's the best way to, to see that. The um, only problem for that kind of visualization is that people have to study a lot to understand what's happening on, on, on this. So it depends on the audience. You cannot put this to a grandmother, for example. She will not understand anything. There is, so Mike Bostock, uh, prove that. Uh, the only problem with, uh, that I see for this visualization is that you, have, you cannot compare, for example, algorithms. Or it's kind of difficult. And you have only one state, one initial state at each time. So Aldo Cortesi, another um, uh, big brain on the visualization, tried to uh, say how we can compare all our algorithms. So here we have four. Uh, it's kind of <laughs> um, we have each, uh, the, the time is in the x axis, and you see from the beginning to the end how the algorithm sort our lines. So the, the lower are in, in dark color, and the, uh, the greater colors are in are the, the larger uh, values. Uh, so here, uh, what is interesting is that you can see how it behaves, you can see how things are swapped, and you uh, also uh, can s answer the question, for example, uh, is the algorithm sorting elements linearly, uh, exponentially, or logarithmically? So for example, we can see that selection sort and insertion are more linear, while the bubble, which is more effic efficient in the documentation, is more expansional. So here, uh, what is good is that we compare really the behavior uh, the swapping is more clear uh, to our eyes. Uh, the only problem, again, is that we have only one initial state. Uh, it's like uh, we're putting a, a, a unique situation, and we cannot compare the algorithm uh, over many um, states. So here is a way with animation, which can be a bit clear. I think it's my favorite. Uh, you have all your algorithms, and you have 
four initial states, so the random, sort, nearly sorted, reversed, and few uniques. And you can, can compare all these algorithms and how they behave. You can also add uh, larger figures, for example. And uh, what you can do is you can stop and just, for example, run insertion or just run uh, a line. So here what we can see is that selection and insertion are also the less efficient. And it's clearer to our, our eyes that the efficiency is, uh, uh, we have less efficiency uh, in insertion, selection, and bubble sorting. Finally, uh, we have a more artistic point of view. So uh, here for these pixels that we want to sort, um, we have four algorithms here, cocktail, insertion, shell, and combo. And we want to sort this uh, arc-en-ciel. Uh, so you have pixels in column uh, and different initial states. And we want to sort them. So we're going to see how it behaves. It's more an artistic way, but maybe the best one for explaining it to your grandmother, for example. And here again, the insertion sort works really slowly. So that's maybe the, the funniest way to explain how sorting is working. And it seems that cocktail sort is not that good also. OK, to conclude, um, what we've tried to do is to see an algorithm, and many algorithms inside the sorting algorithms. Uh, and we've seen that it's a hard subject to, to visualize it. Uh, we have always drawbacks. It can be the initial states, a few figures, or one, only one initial state. Uh, we cannot compare them e easily. Um, if we choose animations, we lose the, way, the understanding, but we have a, a fun way to, to look at them. Uh, and when we have dense and static displays, it's hard to understand in one uh, view uh, what's happening. Uh, so for, for, for us, the um, visual visualization is the biggest challenge today, because more and more algorithms have, are done um, and uh, have insights. And to, to use them in uh, our everyday life, uh, we must uh, find a way to explain them. And uh, some people, like a website I, I advise you to, to see, at 2 d 3 dot com, that is doing a really um, good study in machine learning using data visualization and using a story and data storytelling to explain uh, the difference of price between New York and San Francisco houses. Thank you. <laughs> we can take questions if you want, in French or English. <laughs> yes. I find visualization to be a very powerful tool. Um, in practical terms, how do you how are you collecting this data? Are you, is it is, are you embedding code? Or are you analyzing logs? What are you doing to produce the data to visualize? Well, at the moment, our customers are mostly coming from business. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> At the moment, our customers are mostly coming from uh, the business world, so they already are engaged in uh, the process of collecting a lot of different uh, data from many different sources. And we present what we do as the last mile of, of this process, where we, <coughs> we have a big uh, service part of, in our offer, where we work with uh, people, to, um, with, with our customers, to understand what they are doing with their data and, and where, where basically they need to, to, to see it more clearly. And then it's only then that we, we do the last mile of uh, gathering um, the, the aggregations, mostly sm much smaller data, and doing uh, this kind of uh, data storytelling. Yeah, visualization is uh, for us uh, really a challenge of communication. When you visualize correctly, you can communicate easily and make your insights understand understandable. And that's why uh, many man of our businesses uh, come with their data already done. All the questions, okay. The examples of are on relatively limited data sets. If you have, say, a trillion items you're sorting, um, are you, do you have the ability to, to visualize that as well? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, 
I mean, on on the biggest uh, uh, the the projects we did with the the, the largest data sets um, is mostly because it's uh, historical data. So what we use is that we do a dynamic uh, view of, of uh, a window in time, and then we, we find ways with navigation to, to move this window, uh, but keeping the, the same representation intact. So when, when, we, when we work with the biggest data set, often it's with uh, windowing uh, systems. One of the biggest data set, for example, are related to social, um, social media, for example, and the objective is to uh, condensate the information to give only the biggest insight and not uh, uh, lose people uh, around the, all the information. Well, we've done a project as well with um, Wi-Fi uh, points inside the uh, public places, uh, which are used to, uh, with triangulation to, to see how, how the space is used. And in this case, we used uh, also uh, navigation in, in uh, space, uh, in, uh, so, so you could move on the map and, and zoom in on the, on the parts of the data you want to see. Thank you.